So good morning, uh, good morning everybody once more. Uh, welcome to the Top House Forum on Integrated Housing and, and Support. Um, I do really hope you enjoyed yesterday the award ceremony and, and the dinner. And uh, I don't know if some of you attended the Pilates session this morning. Uh, so now we will do some, some mental pilates. pilates. We will need to uh, stretch uh, our minds to uh, discuss about uh, integrated housing and support. Uh, so my name is uh, Carmen Arroyo de Sande and I'm development manager at EASPD, uh, which uh, stands for the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities. And um, my uh, organization, it's an European network that represents 17,000 uh, service providers and their umbrella organizations in, uh, in Europe, in 33 European countries. And our objective is to um, promote the equal opportunities of persons with disabilities via high quality support systems. So, why we are here today? Uh, well, at ESPD, we also uh, support our members in developing uh, innovative support models, and uh, housing is one of our main priorities. So we wanted to, uh, to work a little bit more in the better integration of, uh, of housing and support. We wanted to, to gather innovative uh, practices. So then, uh, who else, uh, who better than, than the SL Foundation and the Zero Project to help us to do, to do this job? Uh, so uh, we decided to put together a, a project application, um, and it's called Top House. It's a project uh, funded by the European Commission, the Erasmus uh, Plus program. Uh, and then ESPD, together with the SL Foundation, uh, brought together a, 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 a some uh, housing and support providers. Uh, many of them are, uh, are here today uh, in, in the panel and in the audience. So um, that's essentially why we are here. Uh, but uh, before giving the, the floor to, to, to Sima to explain you a little bit more about the, the, the Top House project, um, I have some um, practical issues, and is that um, we are going to circulate a, a signature list. It's not that uh, we want you, uh, your signature because you are all famous, which maybe one day or you are already. It's because we need it for project reporting. So please uh, circulate the, the, the document, uh, pass it around, and then make sure that me or uh, Sima um, uh, have it, uh, has it uh, at the end of the, of the, of the event. So um, I will introduce now our first presenter. As I told you, Sima uh, Muntakal from the SL Foundation. Uh, she's a project manager at the, at the SL Foundation and is the, the coordinator of, of this project, the Top House project. And um, she will explain you a little bit more about the project, or as we like to call it, is our baby. This is how we call it uh, in, a, in our weekly conversations from Brussels to, to Vienna. So please, Sima, the floor is, uh, is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Carmen, for the nice introduction. Um, yes, I will be talking today. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about, uh, about Top House, our baby. And um, so what we want to do with Top House is uh, to, I will start right with the key objectives, what the key objectives for this project are. That, are, that is developing an integrated uh, housing environment by incorporating on the, the UNCRPD principles on the one hand side, and on the other hand side, we have um, we want to provide staff in the housing and support sector with uh, quality assessment tools that um, also include a person, um, an individual um, uh, support needs by using a person-centered approach. So these are the main objectives that we try to achieve by with Top House. So. Um, sorry, I forgot to click. Yes, that was the first slide. Moving on to the next slide. So our Top House baby has uh, a lot of parents, and um, I would like to briefly introduce you to um, all the inspiring and empowering organizations that are working behind this project, which is, um, I will start with the ASPA Foundation from Finland. Um, then we have uh, support from uh, Spain, the Irish Council for Social Housing from Ireland, uh, our British partners Homeless Link, the ESPD, 
And uh, lastly, Jugendamwerk and Essel Foundation, who formed the Austrian arm of the uh, project. The next, so we have this project, this, this project is defined in, or divided into three different parts, um, which is, a def we have a definition phase, a development phase, and um, the last phase will, is a training, testing, and localization phase. So what we did in the first two phases is that we, based on research and current practice, partners were able to gather knowledge and um, explore what basically is best uh, for staff uh, in the housing and supports uh, sector, but also for the user. Um, and by incorporating the UNCRPD principles and um, a person-centered approach, um, partners have provided expertise in four key specific areas, which is needs assessment, housing allocation, support provision, and cross-sectoral uh, cooperation. And putting all this knowledge together, we have, um, all partners have produced top house guides on these specific um, topics. Um, you can see like assessment of needs and rights was done by our Finnish partner. The pack on needs and allocation of housing was done by our Irish partner. The support needs and assessment pack was done by our Spanish partner. And lastly, the, the, the developing cross-sectoral cooperation guide is, was done by um, our Austrian partner. Then, um, what we did next is we, once these guides were, um, came together, we then um, extracted a set of learning outcomes out of these guides. Um, and these were then formed into um, several top house products. Um, one is the universal staff training program. Then we have uh, a support with specific educational materials and tools. Then a formalized uh, curriculum and uh, a train the trainer course to increase uh, training capacity and delivery within but also beyond the partnership. So currently we have now, we have now finalized um, all the top house products and we are moving to the testing phase. Um, what, does this, what does this mean? The, this means that all delivery partners will be um, testing and piloting the top house products on national level with uh, stakeholders. And um, um, this also helps to build awareness and acceptance of the top house uh, products, but also which uh, uh, something that is very important, a very important aspect is to build and develop local supported uh, housing partnerships. Then, in addition to uh, all these top house products that we uh, uh, have produced, um, we have also created a top house report, which was also done alongside all the other products uh, at, this, at the same time, um, which we're launching today. It is available online, and um, I want to just give you a brief overview of what this uh, top house uh, report consists of. So it is basically an overview um, of existing, already existing promising practices on, at European level, but with the focus on uh, four EU countries, meaning Austria, Finland, Ireland, and Spain, basically our delivery partners. Then we, are, we have an analysis uh, of what is the concept of integrated housing and support, and a general overview of so, uh, social housing in Europe. This is then followed by country reports that each of our delivery partners have produced. Um, I would not talk too much about it because we have like a, we, our Spanish and uh, Finnish partner will uh, tell you a little bit more about the country reports and how these came together. And um, at last we have a set of promising practices gathered in, which are also in the top house report. So for this we, um, uh, launched a call last year in March 2018, and um, the, eligible, the the criteria for that uh, for for that were um, that must be a promising practice implemented in Europe. It must be a running practice. Then the target group was uh, persons with support needs, but also 
being aware of the specific needs of elderly and the homeless people, and the homeless. And um, we were looking at practices uh, uh, with, from different housing environment um, that were persons living in institutions, persons living in larger homes, uh, maybe in group homes, community settings, um, but also people living in their own flats and with their assistance. Um, other, but most importantly, what, uh, the most important criteria we were looking for, there was a rights-based model, then also reflecting again the person-centered approach, and uh, lastly, it has to had to have the highest degree of user involvement when it comes to when it came to design, implementation, and the ev evaluation process. Um, so we gathered, we, we received um, in 46 um, promising practices, and out of that we selected 21, which, which uh, are listed in, the, in this Top House report. Then the findings, so what are the findings um, so far um, during the Top House pro uh, project with the report, with the products itself? Um, so there's still lack of compatibility. What does that mean? Um, there's the resources uh, available and the resources needed from the user, they don't match up. This is one issue. Then the lack of coordination between government bodies is, a, is an issue. Um, and um, then we have um, non-user friendly assessment processes linked to disability um, certificates. Um, currently, it's the case that uh, persons with disabilities have to uh, need to be officially certified in order to obtain uh, social housing, and uh, and most of the time, people are for various reasons have not obtained the certification, or they are not uh, also uh, sometimes comfortable to 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 to. Um, Exp uh, to, to, be to, to get this uh, certain certification. And, um, and another problem is that these certifications, once they have chosen that they need to do it, that it's, it's, uh, it's a long process. So they have to go through uncomfortable clinical and psychological interviews and reports. Um, but it's not all bad. So. There are people like moving towards new solutions. Um, people have been creating new tools in the form of personal support plans. Um, what does this mean? So, um, personal support plans are created by organizations based on the findings, uh, what is important to an individual and what they need uh, in their lives. So, this helps on, to, uh, to solve problems, but also it shifts from the medical uh, model to a social model because the individual is seen as a whole and uh, is recognized as uh, with their wishes and needs. Um, yes, and most importantly, uh, placing the individual at the center of all processes is key here. Then we have um, the development. While we, do, while we were doing all this research and uh, gathering of knowledge, we came to the conclusion that uh, developing a new occupational and professional profile could be also a key success um, when it comes to um, um, house, uh, staff in, in housing, in the housing um, and support sector. Because persons, currently the, the situation is that uh, persons with disabilities need to, when they um, in need of housing, they need to go to several places to explain their situation. Uh, it could be like with their social workers, then they have to go to the real estate agents, uh, agents and, and explain their situation there, and maybe to funding experts as well. So gathering all this knowledge and like developing a new occupational professional uh, profile could be key here. Um, then lastly, um, so, I want to conclude with that despite uh, the achievement in recent years, the report and all the findings of the uh, Top House Partnership clearly points out that um, 
previous pitfalls uh, need to be avoided by um, a stronger focus on, we, have, we need to have a stronger focus on practical ways, then we need to have tools, practical tools and resources to implement person-centered approaches. Um, and yes, so that the person with special need uh, has the opportunity to exercise choice in their lives just as any other citizen. So what we want to do with Top House is continue raising awareness that stronger networks um, are needed where all relevant stakeholders um, are involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sima, uh, also for, for being on time, which is uh, something very good also for the other uh, speakers. And uh, indeed, now after the presentation of the project, we will, we will go to, 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 to the real thing, what, what is happening on the ground. Uh, and as, as Sima said, I'm part of the, of the Top House legacy. Um, something I think that uh, you can see from, or you will see from all these presenters that I have here uh, today with me is that um, they are really developing networks and cooperation structures in, in the, uh, their organizations and in their countries. And also, um, they are being successful in uh, the transition from institutional to community-based care. So let's have a look to, uh, to, to what is happening, and we won't go far. We are staying in, here in, in this country, in Austria. So, um, Robert, please, you can introduce yourself and then do your presentation. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Robert Ritter-Kalisch. I'm a human services manager, and I'm a regional director of uh, Diakonie Work. That is an uh, NGO, an Austrian NGO. And I'm very happy to get the opportunity to present Project LENA, which is an intergenerational inclusive housing project in Austria. Uh, just a short background, Diakoniewerk runs about 150 institutions and develops numerous projects and services that specifically address people with disabilities, elderly people and refugees. Uh, Diakoniewerk also supplies health and educational services, including hospitals and schools. Um, for a few years now, Diakoniewerk and its sub-company Syncare uh, have been focusing on the issue of affordable and assisted living for elderly people by evolving cross-generation housing models. And one of these models uh, was the starting point for Project LENA. So what is LENA? LENA is an abbreviation of the German expression lebendige Nachbarschaft, which means a lively neighborhood. Um, LENA is the attempt to build an inclusive district in which it wants to establish a sustainable and lively neighborhood community to provide independent living for diverse target groups. Uh, what is the story behind Lena? There was a, a, a property developer who planned to build a housing estate with 45 flats in a small town in Upper Austria. And uh, 17 of those flats were supposed to be reserved for elderly people with need for assistance. And so he came to our organization and asked if we had a, a, a a sheltered living concept or at least would provide services for this target group. We took the chance to collaborate and we suggested a design for a social housing idea that would be far more than a common barrier-free sheltered living concept. The basic aim was to evolve a unique supporting structure for people with disabilities, for elderly people and other people lacking support of society such as single parents but also for people not in need of assistance. Uh, the work on Project LENA was accompanied by a campaign to encourage people with intellectual disabilities that have been living in institutions for very long uh, to move from the institution and live in their own accommodation. Uh, so LENA finally helped four people that have been living in institutions for decades to live an independent life. And another 10 followed in other projects in the region, region and also left their residential homes to live on their own. Um, one major characteristic of Lena is the role of a housing coordinator. Uh, her main task is to support and encourage contact between the neighbors. Her presence strengthens the support network and the development of a stable community within the housing complex. The housing 
coordinator, and that's what we could negotiate, is financed by the property owners and also with contributions from the tenants. Um, the coordinator is planned to work over a limited period of seven and a half years. Uh, and this will eventually evolve in a self-organized system by the tenants themselves. Another specific aspect of the program is the incorporation of the Lena spirit, as we call it, in the architectural planning. Although um, our organization was involved at the point when planning was quite advanced, if not finished, uh, we succeeded in constructing a building with specific elements in a way that it initiated coincidence, as we call it. Um, that means meeting points in the building shall stimulate and support community, communication, and co-incidental encounters. Um, just an example, the laundry area uh, includes a playing area for children. We also managed to establish a common room for meetings, parties, and other activities. The property also has a joint garage for bike repair and crafts. And the idea was that all of the communal spaces, such as hallways, elevators, spaces for mailboxes, and even uh, rubbish and waste are designed to offer the opportunity for people to come into contact. Um, the flats in the property were marketed under the brand Lena and the aspect of providing additional social benefit for prospective tenants. And we saw that a vast number of tenants showed interest in the project for the reason that they wanted to be part of some kind of neighborhood community. As I mentioned previously, the program included a campaign to empower people with a history of long-term living in institutions to live in an apartment for which they are completely responsible. Um, therefore, uh, to, to provide assistance without a, the background of an institution, we had to develop a model for assistance, a pilot scheme for person-centered care based upon a personal support plan, um, and we had the government providing financial support for paid assistance and care. Uh, the interesting point is that a similar scheme, a similar model, has been up to now only available for people with um, physical disabilities in Upper Austria. Uh, it was not accessible for persons with uh, intellectual disabilities. We are now awaiting a legal amendment which will open the possibility of personal assistance for people with intellectual disabilities and will multiply their chances for an independent life. So just short, what is everyday life like in Lena? Um, when the tenants of Lena moved into the new housing project, they first organized the flea market so that they could swap goods for their apartments. Um, they also established a telephone chain uh, between themselves with the idea that they always have a help and support network. Uh, there are numerous joint activities for the tenants, such as games nights, coffee parties, the weekly Lena getting together, uh, many of them organized by themselves or with support from the housing coordinator. Um, the project was accompanied by a scientific evaluation involving the tenants. It was conducted by the Uni University of Applied Science in St. Pölten, and it was made over the period of a year. The main goal of the research was to learn about the value of the program for the tenants as well as stakeholders, and to learn more about the requirements for an appropriate coordination of such processes. We learned that inclusion, diversity, and mutual help is highly valued by the tenants. Um, a future challenge is the need for an earlier involvement or for an early involvement with the targeted groups, uh, bringing them into the decision-making process, especially concerning the architectural plannings. There have been some last-minute decisions that were not so, so good in this, uh, this project. Well, the Akunivik and Sinke are currently involved in five other similar projects in urban areas in Austria. Um, let me finish with some more pictures and some words from the people living in the lively neighborhood. Thank you.
thank you very much, Robert, for your excellent presentation. In, indeed, uh, of course, from the perspective of service providers, it's very nice to see how the concept of support is evolving. So support can be elsewhere in the community. So this, this is something that your project, it, this is something that helps to visualize that things are already changing, that we should embrace this, this new, new model and perspective. I, I also think that it was essential uh, the cooperation with the property developers, something that uh, maybe we can discuss a little bit uh, later on how, how that cooperation works. Um, and then I also take the, 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 uh, the, the success factor of the early involvement of the person with disabilities themselves, not the, 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 the design for all approach from the very beginning, which I think it's, it's uh, uh, really effective. No? So, so thank you very much. Um, now from Robert, we go to, to Kirsi. And, um, well, I will let you to introduce uh, yourself. Um, you will see now that this, this concept of the evolution of support is really something that also uh, in KVPS the organization Kirsi represents is, is something they also take, let's say, very seriously. So um, the floor is yours, Kirsi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carmen. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kirsi Konola, and I come from Finland. Um, I come from an organization called KVPS, Service Foundation for People with an Intellectual Disability. We are uh, few words, just few words about us first, because I think our background is also quite relevant when I, uh, about when I introduce, introduce the program here. Uh, what I'm, uh, but the, the program I'm going to introduce is the supporting quality of life through co-production and collaboration with staff and families training program. Uh, so I, I, I intend to explain you something we work, it's, it's an ongoing program in our organization involving all our staff and all our, uh, all our let's say, clients, users and their families. And we have developed it uh, since 10 years. Uh, so we have uh, some evidence already by, by the results, results of it. But first, a few words about the background of, of our organization. Uh, we are founded by Inclusion Finland, which is a family's organization. Uh, so our roots are in, in family-led uh, governance, let's say. Uh, so uh, families have always have a very important role, role in, our, in our organization. Uh, uh, the, our board members are our family members and also people with a disability. And so we have always have a very strong push to, to involve uh, the families, families of people and people themselves as a service provider. And, and also I think uh, quite important also related to the, to the, uh, the first example is that we um, may, the main focus of our work is to support people with uh, more profound disabilities. Uh, so, um, big, big majority of, of people who use our services uh, have moved out from institutions. We have supported them to move out, and, and, and then now we are supporting them to live in, in the community. And of course, uh, families pay, pay, play also a fundamental role, role in that. Uh, we are committed to develop new innovations which can make a difference in the lives of people with intellectual disability and their families and improve the quality of life. Uh, I also want to, to highlight that we are not anymore, of course, we know that these, uh, these terms are always changing and, and also we support much more other people than people with intellectual disability. It's not very fundamental for us, uh, the diagnosis of, of people, but, but uh, a lot of people with different kind of, uh, of backgrounds are, are involved in, in, our, in our services, let's say. Uh, we carry on different kind of uh, activities um, uh, in development activities, residential res group homes, uh, personal assistance. Uh, we support employment, uh, all, all sorts of all sorts of uh, activities all around Finland. We have around 700 staff and 1,000 people who use our services. And this program, which I'm introducing, concerns all all of these people. Uh, so the background is that uh, the family members play a key role in every person's life. Of course, we know that. All of us have it. Uh, we have uh, our families, we, our background, and that's very fundamental for all of us. And, uh, and sometimes it's seen, we all know it, uh, working in the sector, that in, in sometimes it's seen as a controversial 
role. Uh, that the relationship uh, and social in and inclusion of uh, people with disabilities uh, should be uh, the core task of, of the of the frontline staff, but sometimes it's seen very controversial. Uh, but that uh, what uh, the family is, what kind of role the family is playing in the in the, in the life, uh, what is the self determination of a person uh, themselves, and then and the, what is the role of the staff. And as we have this uh, this strong push from our background and from the governance to involve families, we have started to find out ways how we can really. Uh, make it useful all this collaboration and so that the families can play the key role in the lives but still support the self-determination and like Carmen said and Seema said that the, the core of the top house project is the exercise the choice of people and we have found that people with disability with intellectual disability they need a, a solid let's say ground to be able to exercise that that uh, choice. So they can't do it in, in vague, but they, they need to grow their self-esteem and their self-respect, and, and that's why we have to uh, try to involve everybody who is important in their lives to, to, to support the growth of the person, let's say, uh, so that the staff and the family cannot crash the person in different sides, but work together. Uh, uh, so uh, there, there should be a competence to enable family leadership to, and to respect the family's ex expertise. Uh, we, we strongly believe that it's up to the, uh, the expertise of the staff uh, to, to enable the families to, be, to play the strong role in people's life. And, and, and through this, we will support the self-determination and independence of a service user. We believe that this is this kind of a triangle. Uh, which is fundamental for the well-being of a person. Uh, so, um, we support the collaboration and mutual understanding, the services and the families can support the good life, I think, together of a person with disabilities. So, uh, and what's needed, uh, it's training and tools, I think. We have found out that um, the attitudes are good. People want to work together. They want to. Uh, they want to support the good life. Everybody wants to do the to see their family member to be happy and to, to live fu fulfilled life. But but all uh, but not always there is this um, uh, understanding of, of the roles and what can everybody do to support that. So there there has to be um, kind of um, we have to create spaces to, to find the, the mutual mutual understanding and we need and the and the staff needs competence to do that. Because also I think when we come to the, what, what was said by the Top House project that we need to define a little bit new, in a new way the, the, prof the professionalism of the sector, I think this is also one example, example of that, that we need to, the staff needs uh, competence for the to support the collaboration, communication, and to, and to take everybody in, involved. We have found out that quite often this uh, before, before the program in our organization, where we have this very strong push to, to do the collaborate with the families, it was sometimes very stressful for our staff because they found, out, found that there is um, disagreements and it's uh, sometimes aggressive and, and so on. Uh, so they really needed uh, um, um, more competence and, and uh, let's say the the culture of the organization has to support that kind of uh, that kind of initiative so that they can be there in a in a in a more solid way uh, so the um, i think the the core of the program is the is the creation of trust i think that we create trust among among different parties and and we want to push uh, let's say uh, respectful a respectful interaction. That's quite important, and it's it's very e it sounds very easy. Of course, we are all adults. We work, and we are professionals in the social social care. But still, sometimes it's it's not, it's not so easy to to take into account what does it mean to respectfully interact with all the stakeholders and to understand, for example, why the family is defensive of something. Why are they? Uh, why are they looking at some small details in the service and not seeing the whole picture? We have to, 
to see and to understand the mindsets of, of different, where does it come from, why the families want to protect the people with disabilities so much and so on. And then when we understand this, then we can move forward and then we can find the, uh, then we can also find the, the self-determination and so on for the person with disability when the families also are on the same side, side with that. So, improving skills and competencies of ta staff in supporting the re relationships. And I think it's important that we say that we utilize the expertise of the families. That there is this family leadership, very important, uh, and, and in the services, we, so as service prov providers, we should find out how to utilize it to support the good life of a our service users. And I think that that has been quite fundamental finding, finding for our organization. And with this uh, understanding, we are able to, uh, let's say, uh, make our values real. And when our value is to respect people and to take a, and to the family collaboration and so on. So I think with, with this kind of, um, with this understanding, we can, we can make it uh, real. Like was mentioned by, by, by previous speakers, the person-centered approach is the, the key of the, of the Top House project, it's also the, the key of, the, of our, our program. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to history, the values, lifestyle, lifestyle, personality, hopes and dreams of service users and their families. We believe that we have to find out what is the background of a person, where does he come from, uh, as what kind of person he or she is in our service, and to respect that background, and then we can start to build up this understanding and uh, utilize of the, of the family expertise on top of that. So, so it's very much the person-centered approach and different uh, well-known tools uh, used in, in that approach, what we use a lot, lot in this, in this program. program. Uh, what we believe that in this, in this program we have been able to transfer the, the traditional attitudes and role, uh, roles into the solution-orientated approach. Because uh, sometimes there is a lack of solution orientation, I think, in, when we talk about these relationships and, and, and this kind of thing. The, but, um, uh, but we have um, found out some ways to make it real and in practice that family members and staff work in the same side, promote the good life of a person with disability. And, and this, this is, I think, the, what, what is the innovation, let's say, innovation in this program. And that the expertise of the family members and staff are valued both. That we are always creating the program on both of, both of those. And that, uh, that um, together they are creating the, the solutions and practices because there is a lot of knowledge in, in both, both of those, these groups. So to, when we put that together, we can, we can create something. So the, the impact created, like I said, we have worked with this 10 years already, so we have seen some, some impact uh, in, in our services, uh, increased service user well-being and, and customer satisfaction, let's say, let's say that. We have, a very, uh, we have a way to, to measure that yearly, of course, in our organization, and we see, uh, we see an increase in that. Increased trust and involvement of the family members also improved. Also, this is evidence evidence based, and increased competence of the of the of the staff. All of this is uh, the evidence and impact we see we see after the work of of that of ten years. And also, I think quite interesting for the service users that the program has also impact on the municipalities, let's say local authorities, who order to pay the service because uh, they see that uh, the, there is less uh, disagreements, uh, less resources used to, uh, to fighting with each other and things like that, the, the useless uh, solving controversial issues and more resources is used in a, in a good way to build up, the, build up the society and build up the communities. Uh, we finance it by ourselves, and I think it's important that it's uh, it's a 
it's, a, it's not a project, but it's a part of our organization and part of our culture, what we do yearly. We, we just decide together, the team of the year, let's say, with, uh, with, um, in our, with our services. Uh, for example, last year it was self-determination. Then we worked in all our services, in, let's say in, we have around 40 services around Finland. We worked in all of those with the staff, with the service users, with the family, with this team. We organize trainings and, and discussion events with the, with the families and so on. And yearly we do that. Sometimes in the regional basis, sometimes at local basis. And it varies year to year. And this is the, let's say, triangle of the, of the interactions between, between different groups and highlighting the, the, the importance. And I think that in this kind of cycle, we can, we can say that it's a one form of co-production that we, we co-produce co the service together with all, with all the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsi. I, I think also, like in the, in the case of Robert, it's, it's, it's great to see how new and innovative con concepts are emer not only emerging but also working. Um, something we, we realize in the Top House project is that cooperation is not so self-evident. So it's not so easy to to really implement this, let's say, this uh, true. A co-production approach. Uh, there is a, a lot of, let's say, theory, but in practice, it's not so. It's not so easy. That's why the, the top house materials. Uh, what we have gathered a set of practical tools for staff members on how to implement uh, this this approach. So uh, I'm sure that, uh, or I hope that, uh, once the materials are ready, they will be available to, for all of you to 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 use them. Something also very relevant, Kirsi, that you mentioned, the cooperation with municipalities. Uh, we have a special pack on cross-sectoral cooperation. Our friends from from Austria, as you can I'm aware, are, are uh, in charge of that. And, and it, it was, um, I would say, fun to say that we thought, oh, that, that is going to be uh, an easy uh, part of the project. Not at all. Uh, but I think they are doing a great job. Also, so you will have also some useful materials on how to uh, cooperate with the, with the municipalities. So um, now uh, we go to the Czech Republic. So um, we have um, Lucy with us. Uh, so also, Lucy, if you can introduce yourself and explain what you are doing at uh, Portus Praha. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Lucia Šiškova, and uh, I'm speaking on, on behalf of a uh, small scale organization uh, which provides housing for people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, we served about, well, presently uh, to actual time, 23 people only, but uh, we met like something like uh, 30 to 35 service users in our history. Uh, first, can we? Do I have? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, what I would like to talk about, um, you know, to, to take you to you know some background of uh, of the organization. Am I on the right? Yeah. And then uh, to speak a little bit about what we see as our strength and uh, what we bring, you know, as a new aspect or innovative aspect, and what we see as a difficulties in our work, and uh, contrary what you know, what are the drivers of the change of you know, what uh, takes us on, right? Um, it is important to say that uh, we are still talking about a situation in our country where you know, majority of people with intellectual disabilities live in big institutions. And this is also the place where our organization started. You know, as you see the blue arrow, uh, there was a big institution for Prague citizens and uh, few volunteers uh, some 20 years ago uh, actually together with the management of the institution decided that they would uh, take the offer of the empty vicarage near Praha and would start a project of supporting a supported living house for people, actually for citizens of Prague uh, whom the institution served. 
So the aim was to, to offer the alternative, alternative life to, to life uh, in institutions, to bring some people nearer to, the, to their families, uh, to bring them to uh, the society and offer the decent life, uh, the life similar to people you know, to, to nor living in the normal community. Also to, uh, you know, to participate in community uh, life. So uh, in 2001, five uh, residents moved to a little village, Slapi. Uh, and as uh, we got new applicants, new people coming in uh, in time, uh, some learned new skills, or more, um, all learned uh, new skills, but uh, some learned so much, they made such a progress. And also we had new applicants, so that we decided to build another house. Uh, we opened it uh, in 2008, and it served, or it serves uh, seven people. It provides seven independent little flats. Uh, and the uh, assistance there is uh, limited and it's there only during the day. Uh, whereas the, the original house in the vicarage uh, serves the people with uh, more support needs, uh, more, uh, yeah, more support needs people. But as time went, you know, some people decided, so some service users decided they actually they would like to uh, go still further, they would like to live in the community, uh, and that the service, you know, uh, is, is too small for them. Uh, so we quickly uh, opened or registered new terrain service that uh, actually helps now six uh, people at the present time who render their flats somewhere in the community in the towns nearby and has learned to, to manage their uh, absolute independent life. So uh, this is how we react to, to needs of, uh, of our service users. Um, what is important for us uh, to look at people's wishes, at, at their needs. Um, also, um, we recognize work as a very important moment in adulthood. And uh, what I already mentioned, you know, to be part of the community. I will talk about it more now. Uh, how do we respect people's wishes and preferences? We, uh, implemented person-centered planning, people uh, bring for their sessions, for the meetings, for planning meetings, their families, their friends, their co-workers from work, and they together uh, look at, you know, person's life and dream with him and support him. They, uh, you know, uh, offer fulfillment of, of his wishes, of his, of his needs. And thus, uh, you know, it, it gives great opportunity for, for person, you know, to really rely on, or, you know, uh, rely on other people who can help him to, to move forward or to, to, to live satisfied life. Um, to get to places where he wants to, uh, to get work he wants to or he or she wants to. Uh, people who come, they usually come from institutions, and sometimes it's, or oh, very often it's, a, very, very often it's uh, their first moment. They can really make wishes and uh, be also responsible for what they wish for and what they, what they do. Sometimes they express very clearly what they want from, from uh, what we see. They describe what they want, but they are not uh, encouraged enough to make the step. Then uh, it's our job to help them, uh, to sit with them and to say what are the barriers of, uh, of their anxiety, what support they need, uh, what can we do for them. Uh, how can we help them to make the step forward? Can maybe document on the story of two people, of a married couple who lived in the original vicarage house, 
uh, and didn't, didn't need much support. Uh, contrary, you know, they were quite unsatisfied and we needed to work with them to see what is actually behind their satisfaction that uh, you know, the regime of the house that is uh, designed for people with uh, more needs, more support needs. And uh, you have to sit down with them and describe what would be different, what do they need actually, how much support they need, uh, what would they lack in the, uh, you know, elsewhere if they moved away. And thus you, you help them to understand and overcome the fear of, of uh, a big change. Um, actually, we sent, uh, so to say, uh, other people to, to the community in a you know, similar way, that you really pay attention to, to their fears. Also, uh, you know, colleagues talked about the families. The same applies to the families. Sometimes uh, it's the close people who are worried for their children. Um, and you need to work with uh, the close people um, the, well, or similar, similar way. Okay, as I said, you know, uh, when first uh, service users came to live, uh, to slap it, to our uh, first place, actually soon as they settled in and started to care about uh, their private uh, homes, we saw that it's not enough, that uh, they need a job, a work, you know. And the, what they met in the institutions were different workshops where they would uh, make baskets or uh, draw pictures or, you know, they would occupy themselves somehow. Um, we actually came to the conclusion that uh, what would be important for an adult to work, to have um, a job that would also bring some value to for the others. So we uh, actually opened uh, a workshop that uh, pro uh, that war um, makes uh, cheese, and we sell it to the restaurants. First, we um, run it really as a, as a workshop, but then we actually went on and set up a uh, social enterprise where some of our people work under under normal uh, contract. The goal is not uh, that our organization uh, gives job or employs all people. Uh, we support those. Uh, we support all our people to, to find their job or work according to their likings. Um, Sometimes it's unpaid job, but it's uh, important for them to, to go elsewhere, uh, you know, to go to the farm. We cooperate with a uh, local farm. Also, some of our people are employed by the municipality. They work in the village. Uh, restaurants, uh -huh. also restaurants uh, offer some, some work opportunities and so on. This is actually, uh, you know, uh, I partly <laughs> addressed uh, this slide already. Uh, we work together with, with community, with the, with the local municipality. We do different events like markets, uh, like open air uh, beneficiary um, festivals. And we bring community into our grounds. Okay, and what is difficult for us uh, is the system of, of funding. We get grants every month, every year. Uh, we can be nearly sure that we will get the grants, but it's, uh, it's always up in the air. And in this atmosphere, you can't really make big plans uh, for, um, for the organization and uh, developmental plans. You, can, you, you know that you, uh, you will be safe or you assume that you would be safe uh, for another year, but to plan something extra, new projects is difficult. And uh, why we are still here and don't give up, because uh, we see uh, that people can uh, move, move on, that they can reach uh, you know, much more in their lives and they, that they actually are satisfied, happy, that they can get into the community. 
um, it's difficult, uh, it's uh, not difficult, it's important to um, work with staff uh, for us to, to take uh, their um, comments into, into our work and to get a change, uh, you know, the organization and, and lives of, of uh, the service users. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Lucy. I indeed, did you point out to an uh, extremely important element when you were explaining about also the, the support you give to find employment. And this is something that is also essential for, uh, for, for the, 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 the new support system, is the continuity of support. Things doesn't finish when someone moves out from the institution or find a house. No, that should be a continuation in the way we, we also we offer support. And also something I think it was uh, uh, very nice to see, sometimes we talk about the development of community-based services, but we need first also to create the community. And sometimes for service providers it's not so evident that we also have a role in, in, in that aspect. Yeah. No? So I think that's, that's something very good from your presentation and something that others can, can take and, and, and try to, to, to adopt. Um, finally, of course, the issue of the demand versus offer, it doesn't matter what we, with models we develop, if there are no houses or places to live. And maybe this is something our next speaker can comment on, because uh, they developed a model 15 years ago, uh, and that model, it has proven to be very effective. Uh, and also it has been already a scale up, something that here in the Zero Project is one of the aims. No? Let, let's let's uh, see those good things and maybe let's, let's try to, um, to adopt them uh, and adapt them. So, Edwin, can you please tell us a little bit more about the Thomas Huiz project? Yes. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad that you're still here around on this exciting meeting. And uh, my name is Edwin de Vos, and I'm a researcher for over 35 years on the topic of disability, employment, and social security. And the last five years, I'm specializing in participative uh, action research. And it is working together with people with disabilities to create inclusive cities. And in one of that uh, projects, I met a boy with uh, learning problems, and he was very proud to live in a Thomas house or as we translate it, Thomas House. Uh, and he invited me into his home and we had a meal together with the nine other inhabitants. And this was for me the first time I was at the Thomas House. And today I want to tell you the story of the Thomas House. I'm not a member of the Thomas House, but I'm, a, it's a favorite thing because it's a, result of a bottom-up approach, and it's against the institutions. So what is the story behind the Thomas Houses? When Thomas turned 18, and you see him here together with his father, Hans van Putten. Hans van Putten is an employer. He is... Uh, thinking uh, economically, but he's also seeing that, that his son was treated bad in the institutions. He wanted to have his son uh, live a good life in a decent home, uh, in a small scale, with eight others, and with the caretakers living with the, with the eight others. And yeah, at that time, the Thomas House was born, the ideal uh, way of living according to Hans van Putten. So what is the concept? 
you see there the first house, the first Thomas house. As you can see, they're often very nice houses. So the concept of the Thomas house, it must be always a normal house, uh, not a typical healthcare institution. There must be independent healthcare entrepreneurs live together with their customers, like in a large family. And this creates an environment of warmth, comfort, and personal attention. So the house consists of nine inhabitants. There's a focus on normal life. It must be a beautiful house. Every young person or older person has a personal bedroom and it has a big and cozy central living room and there are the two sometimes married people sometimes just two caretakers living there and uh, yeah they form a family together The financial aspects, uh, I, I will be short on this because they're, they're complex, but in the Netherlands we have uh, health, healthcare costs and housing costs. And the healthcare costs come from the personal budget in this case. And that is provided by the Dutch government in addition to the regular healthcare system. And that allows to create a relationship between the patient and the caretaker based on equality. And the patient can choose themselves where, by who, and how they want to receive care. And the housing cost is normally being paid by the uh, disability benefit the person receives, or sometimes by his salary that he earns. So, this concept of uh, personal budget is also making it possible uh, that there's a bottom-up financing. And that is very rare in other European countries. So, what is the case now? In 2019, 15 years later, there are 118 locations in the Netherlands of Thomas houses, with about 1,000 inhabitants, 235 healthcare entrepreneurs, or franchisees as we call them, and uh, 700 co-workers. So it has grown uh, from one Thomas house in 15 years' time, uh, to what you could call an institution itself. Uh, but okay, that's, it's been grown bottom up. So. so what is the innovation? Uh, it, it's not only that it's uh, small scale, but it's also a franchise, and uh, a franchise is still relatively new to the world of healthcare, especially to long-term care. It puts the energy in the right place. Healthcare professionals can focus on their clients, and the franchiser provides tools, advice, so the healthcare professionals can take care of their core business, and that is to take care. And the whole concept goes along uh, strong values uh, under which dignity, every human being deserves an as normal life as possible. There must be safety, personal attention is the key to comfort and a safe home. There must be freedom of choice, so the inhabitants can choose the Thomas house they want to live in but also the entrepreneurs choose the inhabitants to ensure that there will be a good group. So there, a result is one story, many storytellers, but 
what I also have to say is, because there are a lot of young people entering the Thomas houses, I mean, young people don't like to live somewhere too long. So they are able to move. That's always also what Thomas did. After two years, he moved to another Thomas house, and that's the possibility they have. They don't have to live there in that institution their whole life. So the impact of Thomas houses, uh, there's a very high uh, customer satisfaction, there's a very high caretaker satisfaction, and uh, the organization model gives attention to both inhabitants and staff. Well, finally, uh, the real impact of the Thomas houses is inclusion. Inclusion in the neighborhood, because it's a small house, or big house sometimes, in a community. So there is a lot of contact with the neighborhood, with the village. Uh, it destroys taboos, because people with intellectual disabilities live inside the community. It takes away fears. It makes sure that people with mental disabilities don't have to integrate in the world of healthcare, but it makes sure that the world of healthcare integrates in the normal world. And finally, I want to say that the first Thomas House led the way to many other initiatives in the Netherlands. So many other parents of, of people with, uh, or young people with learning disabilities, but also parents of uh, children with schizophrenia or uh, autism, they all started to create together, they're all uh, independent but small scale living houses. And nowadays even the older people start organize it in their own uh, houses and care. So uh, it's a really re revolution in the Netherlands that started 15 years ago and uh, is still doing well. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Edwin. In, indeed, also, you, you, you refer uh, to, to extremely important issues, as some of them is that the supports need to follow the person and not the other way around. And yes. I think the funding streams need to reflect all that. So it's, I think it's an important message for all of us to, to consider. We will um, uh, discuss a little bit more about the, the, the funding schemes and, and, and how we can uh, make sure that uh, certain um, funding instruments as personal budgets can be, can be used in, in the best way for, for the person. Before uh, we go um, to uh, our last speaker in the panel, I, like, I would like just to remind you to please sign the signature list. It's important for us, so if you have it with you, someone have it, please pass it around. It's, um, it's fundamental, it's pure gold for us, so take that into account. So uh, now I'm, I'm very happy to, to go back home because even if as you can see from my accent, I'm Spanish, I live in, in, in Belgium now and Belgium is my home. So uh, nothing better than, the, than Joris to, to tell about what is happening in, in, in Belgium. Yeah, good morning. Um, my name is Joris Brekene. I'm from uh, working for uh, Zewopa. It's, um, uh, an organization um, who is based in Antwerp, north of Belgium, in Flanders. Um, and I will tell you some, some things about um, our work in uh, neighborhood centers um, and um, the role they play in, in uh, realizing um, inclusion for uh, people um, with disabilities. Um, yeah, okay. I'm not going to tell a lot about CEWOPA, but um, what's, what's quite important is that we, we started in 1981 with an, a very informal structure, uh, two work groups who 
um, worked around two teams, uh, mobility and independent living. Uh, that was a very informal way of, of, uh, of organizing things and it, it will um, take us to 1988 when we started the first of our six projects uh, independent living um, in cooperation with, uh, with social housing companies. Um, and then we had, a, let's say, a, a phase of, of 30 years formal, formal work. Um, we were a normal organization um, who tried to, to, to generate new to projects independent living. And that phase ended with, with uh, uh, evolving to a, a movement, to an organization, but let's say a movement of inclusive living and housing. Um, and the, 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 the most important moment was 2014 when we decided to, uh, to create the, the community centers, the neighborhood community centers, when we got uh, again in an inform, informal phase of, of working. We, we, uh, we, we stress uh, a lot on, on intersectoral, cross-sectoral work. And so if you do that in Flanders, where there is not a lot of, uh, of possibility to, to cross-sectoral working, then you, you automatically uh, come again in, an, in a very, very informal uh, surrounding. Um, we have some, I can't tell the whole story, but we have some, some uh, special characteristics, I, I think. Um, we work around empowerment, around uh, creating opportunities for employees and for clients. And we approach our clients and our, our employees and volunteers in the same way, um, they get the same opportunities, the same uh, story about um, personal growth. Um, and that all started in 2012 when we, 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 we said to our employees, um, if you are well, if you have a lot of competence, if you are well formed, then you, are, you, can, you can choose to leave us and on, from the moment on you can choose to leave us, you can also decide to stay. So that was a, an, an, a rather new approach in our organization. The, the ability to leave is, is, is creating the ability to stay. And then the, the Flemish government uh, helped us a lot in 2017 by creating the, the personal financing system. Uh, everybody, everybody gets its uh, backpack with, with money, so everybody has now the opportunity to, to leave us. We are uh, um, yeah, an, an, an we, we are not a an, an, an residential institution, but we are quite, uh, well, we have a quite uh, heavy load of, of support, so people can, can find that we are too, uh, too much uh, institutionalized, but uh, we are working on that. Um, but by giving the people the, 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 the money, um, they have the opportunity to go, and if they have the opportunity to go, they have the opportunity to stay. So the, the same uh, proposal we made in 2012 for our clients, we can now, uh, we said to our, to our, to our um, employees, we can now use it also uh, for our clients. Um, so what we, we are very, very keen to, 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 to say to clients, uh, volunteers and, and employees, please embrace change. There is an, uh, um, uh, uh, I think there is, an, there is a promise, uh, if you promise an, an, a non, uh, no change environment in, in, in our kind of uh, organizations, then you have a problem. You have to, to work with change. That's uh, for us a very, very important point. Um, so it brings us with the community centers. The community centers are for us the cornerstone of community building in the neighborhood. Um, we, we work with people with disabilities regardless of their impairments. Um, so um, it's the community center is a, our way to give back to the community, um, community, social housing community, where people with disabilities get a lot of more support than other persons with needs. And that's uh, a lot more, that means 10 times more. Uh, so that's a, a very delicate environment to work in. And that's why we say our, our community centers, which are financed by, by collectivizing uh, personal budgets, uh, are our way to give back something to the community. That's creating community. Um, we, are, we are not, intersectoral working is not uh, an option, it's a necessity. We work intersectoral. In everything that we do, it's always the intersectoral uh, choice. No, we no, uh, never only look to solutions in our own sector, we always are going to look to intersectoral. 
We have a quite unique proposal with uh, volunteers. We, level, we, we recruit them on three levels. We, we speak of our house, garden and kitchen volunteers, our expert volunteers and our policy volunteers. And they are, they are as, uh, in the same way uh, supported as our employees. It's the same policy. Um, yeah, I, I will, perhaps I will skip some things, but um, what's also important, the, the neighborhood centers, they are um, antennas of, of uh, external departments. They are an antenna for uh, healthcare, for welfare. Uh, we always look to opportunities to bring in society in our community center. In our community center, the, the, the people with disabilities are in the driving seat. They, they decide what's happening. They, they can participate whenever they want. They can be uh, the owner of a program uh, if they are ready for it, if they are able to do it. But um, we, we always try to bring in society in our, uh, in our community center. So that we try to transcend the classical, the classical day center activities. That's, that's very important. It's so much more than, uh, than, classical, uh, than a classical day center. Um, we, we, we have already, I have already heard a lot about uh, the work one-on-one, -on -one, uh, proximity, uh, distance, uh, but for us it's, it's very important to work with the space, with the room, with the air between people. Uh, if you want uh, a vibrant, uh, a changing, um, an inspiring environment, it's, it's very important to work with room between people. There you can create things, there you can uh, innovate, there you can give the feeling that every day is a new day and is a, uh, a creative day and, it's an, an, uh, yeah, an, an important day for, for, uh, for the work in our community centers. Uh, some results on, on the bottom, it's, it's quite... Um, yeah, quite convincing, I think, and then you get the, 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 uh, the attention of, of decision makers in Brussels. Um, in 2011, we had 66 clients. We have now more than 200 clients uh, with disabilities, but we also have 150 to 200 clients uh, with, with needs, elderly people, new citizens in Belgium. Uh, so we speak of a community of almost 500 people who are uh, working together in our community center. So that's uh, plus 500 percent. So with only 30 percent of, uh, of extra meanings, uh, financial meanings. So that gets then, then, then it gets very interesting our way of working because we, we get a lot of uh, output. Um, Okay, what's bringing the future? Um, three very important things. I will, I will start with the last one. We have an open source systems, system. So we have no secrets, no, no uh, company secrets. It's all open source. You can come and get, you can, you can uh, our external partners, they, they can participate in our work. They can uh, send a, a worker for a week, for a month, uh, to work with us and to learn what we are doing and they can learn us what they are doing. So that's a very open, uh, open source system. Um, we are, ex we, with our proposal to volunteers, we are very convinced that all the baby boomers who are now retiring, and I'm uh, from 68, so I'm in 70 years, I'm 17 years I'm retiring, so I'm the last one from the baby boomers uh, generation. There is a very um, expert, uh, an, an, a generation with very much expertise who will now retire and who will, uh, I'm convinced, who will be um, who, will, who we can uh, approach to participate in our movement, because it is a movement. Uh, it starts from, the, from the, the community centers and it's starting to, to bring in a, a movement for, uh, to bring together health, uh, welfare and care um, in, an, in a people movement on a local base. And a local base is 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 inhabitants, in our case around the social housing, but uh, in many other places in Flanders it's not about social housing, but we work with social housing, we work with people with disabilities, but you can also do it with, with elderly people, with, uh, with people from foreign countries, countries. There are a lot of possibilities to create this model and to, to uh, copy this model to, all, to other formats. Okay, I'd like to, 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 uh, to end my uh, explanation with some, with some acknowledgements. Um, the people from the Flemish government who have, um, 
who have um, yeah, supported this case to, to bring it in the top house uh, story, the social housing companies who work together with us and all the colleagues, colleagues of my uh, organization who are very uh, proud to be a part of this, uh, of this uh, yeah, vibrant story. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Joris, uh, another example of how creativity uh, can help to, 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 to think about the, um, out of the box a little bit and, and try to see that there are many other solutions uh, available. Also very relevant the issue of the flexibility and adaptability of support. So uh, this is something that uh, we need to consider when designing and implementing or evaluating the, 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 the support. Uh, so uh, I would like to, to thank uh, our panelists for uh, all the, 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 the wonderful presentations and the models you have, uh, um, uh, you have uh, bring to today. And now I would like just to invite other very two important people in the Top House project to join the, the panel discussion. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Ferran from Support Girona in Catalonia, Spain, and uh, Marit Alto from Finland. They are two of the project partners. And um, we would like to open now a more active debate and discussion. Uh, also, please, with all of you, so feel free to, uh, to, 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 to raise your hands and, 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 and pose your, your questions. Um, but now we will start. Um, I would like both Ferran and Amarit to reflect a little bit uh, on their experience in the Top House project, in developing the, the new tool, the new materials. Um, especially, I know that Marit has traveled all around Finland looking for, for the right approach. And sometimes it's not easy or has been not easy, but uh, can you explain us, Marit, a little bit um, when we are talking about integration of, of housing and support, of course, the, the assessment process is extremely relevant. It's, it's really the first approach. So what, what is the situation in, in Finland regarding the, the, the assessment process? What do you have experienced during the, 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 the pathway that you are um, doing working in, in Top House? Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to make a, a short in, intro, I call it intro, before I answer and try to answer your question, uh, because uh, I would like to start with uh, to combine the person with disabilities lives, uh, life with the disability policy decisions uh, over the lifetime for persons with disabilities. And, and when we look at that, uh, it's also connected to what uh, Simma said about uh, the country report in, in some connection, is that uh, when, uh, when we got or the built, we built uh, institutions in Finland in 1960 to 1970s, and, and then the inclusive housing uh, services started about circa uh, uh, yeah, 1980s. Uh, then, uh, and also many people were living uh, with their relatives. So we could see that there was existing two different systems in service providing. And, and that was the inclusive, we're trying to, to include, be included in society, and uh, the one which was uh, uh, um, excluding people with disabilities. So, of course, uh, this, had, uh, uh, this had consequences for persons with disabilities themselves. And, and it took 30 years before Finland uh, did the decision to get rid of the institutions in 2010. The government made the decision to break down the, the institutions. And, and in all these 30 years, it's a heavy, what do you say, back, backpack uh, of experiences where, where the persons with disabilities have about segregation, about to be treated differently, and, and all these uh, things, even if we have talked about, we have developed the inclusive housing and inclusive uh, mindsets, but it was disturbing to all the time to have this push from the excluding service providing, which was the institutions. 
But finally, we get, came, by, came further. And, and I think this is what we are, we are struggling now to clean up the history of, of uh, the persons with disabilities' lives. And, and of course, we have a very um, good tool now uh, in, uh, in the, in the C CRPD. Uh, Finland signed it 2006 and ratified it 2016 to really do a very good job uh, to change the laws, laws so they are in lines uh, of the rights. So, uh, in, in my view, we really are doing in projects and in different ways uh, to develop a new understanding of disability and, and uh, to, to new understanding a way to become a citizen and, and, uh, and strengthen to implement uh, the, the rights in really uh, detailed way, in a concrete way in, in the daily life. And, and here I think we, we have had very good support from the Top House project, which ca came uh, to, to, uh, to ASPA Foundation, where I'm working, and, and uh, we, we have had a very good uh, uh, learning process also uh, when, when we have this Top House uh, project to, to help us. And, and what has happened then um, is that uh, um, yeah, our uh, topic is to uh, develop an assessment tool uh, about needs and rights, personal needs and rights. And as Sema said, it's a, uh, it's a personal-centered approach and also approach to implement the rights. So uh, I don't go so much to the tool, but what is important here is that we really come to the point and look into how does it look, the quality or the qualifications of the support when we look into the person with disabilities identity? Really, are there space enough to, to realize yourself and to be, your, be, you, be as you are? And, and the assessment tools in this situation I think it, it's just, you know, connected to the history is that the assessment tools of needs this time now, it's still too much focusing on practical things, focusing on uh, diagnose based and focusing on uh, functional abilities. Of course, practical support is very important, okay, yes, but uh, I, I think it needs to be added with the qualification of support of your own identity in different aspects. So, so you really can uh, realize yourself. And, and this is um, what we learn now and testing now in, in different ASPA homes, but also with other service providers in Finland to test the assessment tool, uh, TINA, uh, the top house individual assessment of needs and rights and, and see that uh, is this simple enough so the staff members can do it. It can be sometimes so complicated so they, they, they don't have time for it or don't want to do it. But we are testing it and, and also to, uh, to get information from the, the persons who are living in the ASPA homes and other homes and, and also to get the information from the staff and then do some uh, changes. Uh, we'll see. I, I can't say it now because the testing is ongoing. Uh, so that will be a, a surprise later on for us what is going on. Um, can I tell you also about the, the meeting culture we came to um, in this testing? Sure? Mm -hmm. Have I time enough? Then I stop. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. It's, it doesn't take more than two minutes. Uh, yeah. When I was in one of the ASPA homes and we were discussing um, things connected to the assessment uh, tool, uh, 
there were came also, uh, what do I say, by effect uh, in the way it came up that when we are having the meeting with the municipalities and people are sitting around the table, there are professionals and social workers and, and also, of course, the person who are uh, living in, in the ASPA home and uh, to do an uh, individual service plan. And, and they said that many times the inclusion is not real. The person themselves, they are sitting there and uh, uh, perhaps shy or don't, uh, are nervous, uh, don't, don't, can't say what they really want. So then we were thinking that we will test in, in, uh, in autumn, uh, uh, we call it two steps uh, meeting. So the first meeting with the municipality will be uh, about that awareness, awareness raising about uh, the articles in, in the convention, because it seems to be also unclear uh, for many. And then uh, also to, to discuss this, that how can we transfer the rights over to the daily life terms for the person who we are talking about. So it is a question about to make a personal repertoire uh, of rights and, and um, in this way uh, try to, to also assess that the rights really are concrete in their lives. And, and the second meeting will come, of course, to, the, to, to do the individual uh, personal uh, service plan which is, do, which is yeah, it will be in the same way, I think, uh, as, as um, it's done now. But it's important to get this information first. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marit. Yes, sort of, of course. We, uh, <laughs> a big applause, indeed. Um, you can maybe take that seat chair there, and then you can join us for the discussion. Uh, as you can see uh, in the Top House project, we are adopting a very practical approach. Uh, we are really developing tools, we are testing them to see if they work. And they are tools that are being designed uh, by experts, uh, by experience. So this is, is, is really something you can take back home and start implementing it. Um, but of course, then from the allocation, we go to the other side. Uh, and then we need to, to see what kind of support is available. And I'm sure, Ferran, you can somehow echo Jory's words about, well, there is no cooperation between the different sectors. So what, what is the situation in, in, in Catalonia? What are your experiences in the process of developing the, 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 the tools in the Top House project? Uh, thank you, Carmen. Uh, I will introduce myself just a little brief. I'm a social worker working in support, an organization providing uh, multiple and global support for people with uh, disabilities, not excluding anyone. Anyone who needs support, we can provide for them. Um, echoing on, on Joris, uh, what I think is the situation in Catalonia is that we are experiencing uh, a phenomenon that I think it's more common than that we can think about. That is the, the concept of poverty is evolving into Poverty of support, and, and I will explain. Everyone is aware of uh, what is financial poverty. Everyone is aware of what is energetic poverty. And even the EU Commission has regulated on that. Um, everyone knows that uh, not having a family or a safety network can be considered as a family poverty. But on top of that, if you have a disability with all these factors, you have poverty in support. Because in all the areas of life, you don't have anything, practically. So this is a situation that is happening uh, increasingly in, in people, in people's lives, uh, concretely and people with psychosocial disabilities, not so f with uh, intellectual disabilities, but it's happening in, in people with psychosocial disabilities. And, and of course, it's, it's very important to, to work coordinated with, with other entities, with other NGOs, with other sectors. Why? Uh, I'm a social worker, and, and social workers nowadays 
uh, are present in, in a lot of services and are present in, in health settings, in education, in housing agencies, in, an, in the employment sector, uh, in basic social services, in specialized social services, in NGOs or in the third sector or in the community services like yours. Um, and I think that uh, the person-centered approach is something that all social workers who are aware of the UN CRPD convention, principles of choice and control, uh, decision making, are aware of. Uh, but if they do not work uh, coordinated to maximize the efficiency of the available resources uh, and the system, it's like doing work for nothing. You know? and that way we can increase the chances of uh, independent living, of people uh, transitioning from institutions to community settings. We need to increase that type of cooperation. Dialogue with uh, other NGOs, dialogue with the public sector, dialogue with the private sector, and maybe social workers are the key instrument to do that. This is one approach. Thank you very much for running. Indeed, of course, uh, you, you, uh, you mentioned social workers, I mean, and you are a, a person that um, you see this in the, in the daily life. Mm -hmm. But also, you work all in, in this kind of international project when you see legal and policy frameworks, no? so somehow mm -hmm. things need, need to come together. Um, I would like also now to, to, to go to the audience, and, and maybe you have some question, or you would like to have some, some, some reflection. Um, it can be about uh, uh, different aspect of integrated housing and support, or it can be also about what we are discussing here, that sometimes, of course, there is a lack of resources, but in many occasions, it's just the resources available are not used in the best way. So, is someone willing to comment on this? Do you have some question about the, the topic? So please uh, um, raise your hand and, and join us in this uh, discussion. Don't be shy. Okay, so uh, um, maybe you need some more inspiration. Let's see if you can find inspiration in the panel. Let's start with you, Robert. Um, for instance, one extremely important issue, uh, we are talking about the, the availability of housing, the funding, but also the houses as such. So what about real estate developers? What can we do there? I just can say that there is an increasing demand of uh, property developers for creating uh, uh, additional social benefits and that's our experience that they are addressing us uh, and, and demanding concepts to, to, to enhancing quality of life in, in housing complexes. So we are uh, really uh, good in business, meanwhile uh, delivering concepts for, for different housing complexes and, and, and builders. I guess it, it needs to, 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 to manage one pilot project that is successful and then they, they will come and demand concepts. That's our experience. Yes, of course indeed. This, uh, we need this kind of lighthouse pilot. We mm -hmm. need to, to show the, the, the way and, and see that it's, it's, it's possible. Um, so. Uh, it's also maybe the issue, and maybe I will turn now to, to, to Edwin. Uh, you point out the issue of, of course we can't avoid that, the issue of cost. And the differences between one model and another model. That is a question that is there, and we should be able to, to reply. Um, what is your experience in, in, with the Thomas House project in terms of uh, uh, having a sustainable, uh, let's say, model that of course uh, it's um, based on the, on the wishes and needs of the individual and the quality of life of the individual. Well, let me uh, say first that uh, the cost of a young person uh, with mental disabilities who needs health care all year round, uh, almost 25 hours a day, but it's about 85,000 euros a year in the Netherlands. And that's being uh, brought forward uh, by, what I said, the, the personal budget. 
and the housing budget. And what the Thomas houses produce uh, in, in a better way this cost about 15,000 euro less. So it's about 65,000 euro mm -hmm. because you miss the middle management. There are no managers. Of course, there is a, a, a top organization, a, a franchise organization that uh, provides education, that provides uh, also the, the uh, I mean, the organization doesn't own the buildings. They always find out some way that uh, a project developer or whatever what, they own the buildings. And the uh, franchisees, they rent the buildings. And they always, as I showed you, try to find uh, nice buildings. Often old buildings that they uh, take care of because the, and with some uh, space around it so people can walk around their home and um, yeah of course in the Netherlands all, also the, the budgets are always uh, well discussed <laughs> and uh, but it's uh, the, the thing of the personal budget makes it possible for independent choices and then uh, to kick out the big institutions, and they don't like that. But after now 15 years, the big institutions, they, they see that they have to work together with these uh, local initiatives. And also in the Netherlands, municipalities are more important now than they used to be. So the big institutions have to work together with the municipality, have to work together with the local uh, initiatives, and uh, that's starting to, to work out well. But now the, the local initiatives can choose what service provider they want to use, and they, they take contracts of five years, for instance, and then ask uh, different contractors to do an offer and they choose between uh, the five healthcare institutions. So that's a different model. Thank you very much. I don't know if uh, some of the panelists would like to, to react to, 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 to that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So first Ferran and then Marit. Uh, I sincerely like your, your model of, of personal budget because uh, I wish that we had that in Spain or in Catalonia. In Catalonia we work, uh, and in Spain too, with uh, prepackaged services. If you have a mental problem, you are categorized as a psychosocial disability in the certificate, and you only have the right to apply for certain services, but the services are, the funding for the services are allocated directly by the government to the, to the provider of the service, yeah. not to the user or to the person. And that is one of the things that uh, I admire from, from this model. And I think that mm, it, we need to change that way that the administration works. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I think that is the way to go if we want to really enable uh, people to have choice and control over mm, where they want to live or how they want to be supported. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, yeah, I, I associate it to something, and uh, I will I, I will be the brave enough to say it now, <laughs> because there was uh, in early time in the Nordic countries one uh, official person who, who said that if you have very little uh, resources, so use them well, and you don't use them on institutions. And I think this is also connected to, to the idea that when you connect or, or reconcile uh, 
resources to groups and you categorize people in, 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 uh, and have this group thinking, then it's uh, a, a risk of to, to waste also resources. Because I, I was thinking about this, what you said, Hedwin, yeah, uh, uh, that uh, when you go for a personal budget system again, then it's of course connected to the person's needs and it can be that the needs are less and then the resources are, which are needed are less. So in this way, I really support your, your idea what you use in Netherlands. Yes, uh, basically uh, very much the same. I, I, I strongly believe that, uh, that we should add the freedom of choice of the service users. I think that's the fundamental for, for the whole, whole sector, that we are all providers and, and the policy makers and so on. We are supporting the fact that people themselves make a choices and they choose how they want to live. And I believe that's also uh, um, a source of innovation, let's say, that uh, when people get more control. And I also think that, uh, that service users and, and also to families and so on play a very important role there, that we give the control and, and methods to, to show, show how they want to live and what is important for them. And then we, uh, we are planning our services on, on basis of that. One thing what I think is, is quite important also to, uh, to think when we are thinking the innovations and, and good practices around housing across Europe is the, is the regulations in different countries. And I think that's quite often killing the, <laughs> killing the innovation. At least in, in, in my country, we, we have such a huge amount of, of different uh, kind of regulations for the, if you want to establish social service, if you want to establish a service, a service if you want to establish a um, social housing, it's, it's enormous, the amount of, of the regulation coming from different authorities, uh, that it's really killing the, the, the way we can organize different kind of ways. That, so I think at the same time when we have to, when, when we have to listen to people, what they want, we have to also have very strong dialogue with, um, with the policy makers and with the, with the, with the people who are Regula regu responsible of the regulations and, and the legislation to, s uh, to reflect this because without that uh, there is nothing to choose because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help if, if we give the control to people to make choices if the, if the sector is producing three kind of service what is there to choose then so it has to be room to make these innovations work in different kind of um, uh, s surroundings, and, and I think this dialogue with the policy makers is, is fundamental there. That was something that came up to my mind very strongly when I listened very good uh, practices uh, in, in the panel, and then I, I, I found out always then regulations which is forbidding it in my country to make it real, so it's, it's terrible, I think. It's, it's, I, it's terrible when we think about, and also uh, when we think about scaling up the innovations and landing them in different countries, I think this is something we have to pay a lot of attention to. Thank you very much. Yes, we have a couple of questions. Uh, we have one over there, and then we take the one from Luke. Yeah, hi, thank you. My name is Eglantina Slako and I'm coming from Albania, Health for Life Association. For me, it's the first time being here at the Zero Conference and I'm amazed by, by all these uh, innovative practices and the pros that are presented uh, these three days here and I want to congratulate every one of you for the great job that you are doing. Uh, rather than a question, I want, it's a reflection. <laughs> uh, I, I, I heard today all the practices and the piloting project of the top houses, how it is implemented in the countries, different countries. But uh, I want to give another reality for the Albania, for example, that we are missing a lot. The, uh, what was stressed here are the resources. 
uh, which are financial resources. For us here in Albania, financial resources are very, very important because uh, the government doesn't support any organization to provide this kind of services. We are not coming from big institutions. We don't have that practice. We have small uh, residential centers with a number of uh, approximately 200 beneficiaries, and actually we we have only six residential centers in Albania, which we are in the process of deinstitutionalization. Uh, but the the biggest challenge is uh, where these people are going after being uh, from the trans from the institutions or from the residential centers to. To, to where there are families that they some of them don't have families and that's why uh, the organization that I'm representing in this conference which is called Health to Life Association since 20 years we are working uh, in uh, this providing services social services uh, for uh, children and adults with disability because this association is established by parents and in Albania there are the parents who fight for the rights strongly fights for the rights of people with disability and provides services. Uh, we are struggling to combine the community-based rehabilitation programs or uh, approach with the uh, top houses uh, approach because it is very, very difficult to implement each of those without uh, governmental uh, uh, finances. Uh, we as an organization are in the very first beginning of um, implementing the independent living approach to just we, we want to tr try to to strengthen the capacities of people with this uh, youth with disability to live independently in, in their own and I will be a very very uh, uh, thankful if you share with us uh, the documentation how this approach can be replicated in other countries like, like my country where the, the finances from the government are missing and I also will uh, invite everyone to also post their uh, attention to countries like my country uh, where uh, piloting of this approach will be much more than needed. So, thank you. Thank you very much, and, and it's, it's very nice to see that uh, you already use the, the top house approach concept, so of course, top house approach uh, has born, and it's there for you, so uh, we will make sure we get in touch Concepts. and you receive, Concepts. Yeah. <laughs> that you will receive all the, 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 the material. So, uh, a question from Luke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a remark and, and then two invitations, and maybe we should talk after this session, because maybe we can do something together. Uh, I'm uh, Luc Saldelo, Secretary General of uh, ESPD, European uh, Network of Support Services. Uh, we have this discussion as an element of the implementation of the UN Convention, of course, Article 19. And then it is about, uh, and I see the colleague from Inclusion Europe here in, 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 front, in front of me, then it is about living in the community and allowing people to live where they want to live, with whom they want to live. That is absolutely essential. That should be on top of our head all the time when we, when we have these type of discussions. And then indeed, uh, having a budget to, to make that happen is very essential. And we should not forget that there are huge differences, not only in Europe but worldwide, in the budget that is available to make this happen uh, for people. Uh, you cannot compare the situation in Finland with the situation in Albania. It is absolutely essential to understand that, but money is not the only driving force of this movement. Also, without having the resources of Finland, you can do a lot, I think, and that is where our creativity and our cooperation maybe should come uh, into place. Uh, two, two little invitations. Um, we organize an event in Bucharest in April on innovative funding models and systems. And if you're interested, please drop an email and we can send you the, the information. And we will look at how personal budgeting, but also other mechanisms can work to, to, to help us implementing Article 19 in, uh, in a correct way. And the second invitation sits uh, a few seats away from here. My colleague from Flanders, uh, I'm from Flanders as well, uh, he, he represents here the Flemish authorities. And the Flemish authorities changed the funding system 
dramatically. And maybe in a few sentences you could explain a bit what is going on. Because indeed, now the funding in Flanders is not going from the authorities to the service provider anymore, but from the authorities to the individuals that then, in a way, can buy their own support. And that is so empowering. It is so important. Many problems, of course, in the implementation of it. But the concept is there. I don't know whether you are willing, uh, Kurt, to, to say a few lines about that system. Sorry for putting you on stage. <laughs> in the middle, in the middle. Yeah. I think Joris uh, Brackenay has already explained uh, how, you, how you can use uh, the new system we introduced in Flanders. But we made uh, exactly that, that big transition from uh, uh, subsidizing uh, service providers to give the money to the, to the persons. And the bottom line is they can choose whether they want to uh, 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 give it to the service providers by a voucher system that's uh, technically uh, I can explain afterwards if there's someone <laughs> is interested. Or you, you, you do it by personal assistance, uh, by giving cash. But it's always based on the choice. The choice how he want to live, how he want to expand, how he want to uh, 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 depend it. And, and that, that's, that's the bottom line. But in uh, Bucharest, we also be uh, uh, at the SPD Congress. And there we go uh, further in on the, on the whole system. Thank you very much. I think that that was a very nice way somehow to, to conclude this event. I know it's right before lunchtime, so I don't want to be the only thing between you and the food. So I will <laughs> conclude uh, th this event. For me, I have seen uh, several key issues. I would like to, to, to start with this room for innovation and um, the war with, with, with authorities. Uh, that's extremely important. We need to create, I, sorry. Uh, there is uh, another question, and then I will conclude the session. Please. Thank you, Carmen. And thank you, Luke, for waking me up. <laughs> <laughs> Which pleasure. <laughs> Luke indeed lifted up a very important... Uh, excuse me, I'm Jurgi Pinoma. I'm the president of Inclusion Europe. I come from Finland, too, but Inclusion Europe is based in Belgium, Brussels and uh, lifted up a very important article, Article 19, which says that you can choose where to live, with whom to live, how to live, and, and you don't have to accept a certain form of, of housing. And uh, this is very important also because I strongly believe that apartments and the service should be strongly separated so that you rent your home from somebody and then the service comes to your home. And this also uh, reminds me of, of the thing that we, we should nowadays start thinking a little bit differently. We shouldn't always think about care provide, providing. We, we should think that people with intellectual disabilities, for instance, they need help and support to survive their daily life. They, they necessarily don't need uh, services, they don't need care, they, don't, uh, they are not sick. They are people who, who want to live exactly like, like all of us, and that's why it's very important to separate th their home from the services. And one invitation also. Inclusion Europe is organizing a conference on, on, on community living in Vilnius in Lithuania in the beginning of, of uh, June. And uh, our member from Albania is also very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jirki. Uh, uh, so uh, now also using uh, your own words, I will take your own words to, to conclude the, the, the event. You say that apartments and the services need to be separated. And that gives me the opportunity to think about that when we talk about integration of housing and support, it's not that they need to be completely, uh, if I can see, me messed up. No, 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 no. It's that we really need to think about the new way of integrating housing and support. And for that, we need, as I was saying, this room for innovation. The room for innovation needs to come from public authorities, but also needs to come from support services. We can't fear the change. We need to embrace change 
and work all together, of course, to, uh, to make the, the, the shift uh, possible. Um, also, you need practical tools, and this is where EASPD and uh, our work on different projects, uh, it, it can be very helpful for you, so please, um, this is an invitation not to go to another conference. I'm not going to make you travel around Europe again. <laughs> this is an invitation to contact us um, in, in, in Brussels. You can also contact the ESSEL Foundation uh, because they, they are the ones, let's say, having the knowledge on the, different, on the different available models. And of course, you can contact the project partners. They can give you very practical uh, um, experience on, on how they, they did it, which I think that also the peer learning approach is something we should, uh, uh, we should um, develop much more. So that's all from, from my side. It has been a pleasure from this chairwoman uh, to chair this, uh, this session uh, and wish you all a very nice um, evening and stay in, in, in Vienna if you are staying. Uh, so please keep in touch. Bye.